Welcome to episode 7 of my Kawasaki S1 554 cylinder engine build and in this episode we're going to be fitting the ignition timing, fitting the carburetors, connecting everything up and getting it running for the very first time. I'm really pleased how this engine's turned out so far. It kicks over with really good compression so the next thing I need to do is fit four sets of contact breaker points and to do this I need to make a new stator plate. Using my vernier caliper, I measure the internal diameter of the recess in the casing, and it's 90 millimetres. So I use my spring bolt dividers to mark a 90 millimetre circle on a bit of 4 millimetre thick aluminium plate to make the new stator plate. I grip the aluminium plate in my vise using the aluminium soft jaws to protect its finish, and I use my hacksaw to cut it out into a rough square. With the square cut out, the next thing I need to do is grip the piece in the vise and cut off the corners, getting as close to the line as I can. It's possible to cut quite close to the radius with a hacksaw blade, but not as tight as I need to be, so I just do the best I can. All this sawing is thirsty work, and Tracy had just made me a nice cup of tea, so I have a sip before I go over to my lathe to machine it round. To machine the diameter of the plate to exactly 90mm, I rest it on the front face of my chuck and use my rotating centre to pressurise it and hold it in place while I carefully turn the diameter, taking little cuts at a time. After several cuts, the aluminium plate is nice and round, so I check it with my vernier caliper, and it's 92 millimetres, so I've got a couple of millimetres to remove, so I take a few more cuts, and then when I check it, it's just perfect. With the outside diameter machined, the next thing I've got to do is bore a hole in the centre 26 millimetres diameter to fit over a protrusion on the side casing. I use a succession of drills, and then finish off with my boring bar to get the precise size. With the machining complete and the bore size checked, I offer it up to the engine and it fits just perfect. It slides on really nice, so I'm really pleased with that. So the next thing I'm going to do is fit the four sets of contact breaker points. The contact breaker points are spaced at 90 degree intervals, so I first set my degree disc to zero, put the aluminium plate back in my chuck, and I can scratch one line across with my toolbar, then rotate the chuck 90 degrees and scratch another line right the way across, then I've got an accurate mark for drilling the holes. I can now mark out two holes for each set of points. One is the pivot hole and one is the hole to be threaded for the securing screw. With all the holes drilled, I tap out the four outer holes with an M4 tap. With the four holes tapped, I try on one set of points and it fits just nice, nice and tight on the pivot and rotates backwards and forwards. So I stamped that number one and then stamped the remaining cylinders. With the new stator plate now finished, I can put on all four sets of points and do up the screws. Well, I'm really pleased with that. Let's see if it fits on the engine. And it snaps on nicely, engaging in the recess, and rotates backwards and forwards really smooth. So now I can do up the two screws to hold it in place. I kick over the engine a couple of times, and the points open and close perfect. The gaps are a bit big, but I'll be setting those later on with the feeler gauge. The next thing I need to do is cut the four wires down to length and solder them onto the points. So first of all, I make some brass tabs. I'm using some half millimetre thick brass sheet to make these solder tabs. These go onto the points for the wire to attach to. With the brass tab bent at the end, it's all ready to fit to the points. With the brass tab fitted, I can now solder on the wire. 
To make things easier with just two hands, I tin the brass strip, then tin the wire, then you can bring the two together and melt them together. And this way you only need two hands. Well, that's the first wire soldered, the cylinder number one. Just got to repeat the process for the other three cylinders. With the four wires soldered, the next thing I need to do is set all the gaps of the points to 15 thou. So I rotate the crankshaft with the spanner until I get the widest gap and I try the feeler gauge in and adjust the gap till it just slides nicely. I then repeat the procedure for the other three sets of points. To set the ignition timing, I first make up a simple timing device using a battery and a bulb and two pieces of wire. I secure one piece of wire to the engine casing and the other piece of wire goes into the output wire from the set of points I'm setting. So now, when I rotate the crankshaft with a spanner, at the precise moment the points open, the light goes out, and all I have to do is set that position to 2.5 millimetres before top dead centre with a DTI. I rotate the engine back and forth to get the highest possible reading on the DTI, then set it to zero, and then rotate the engine backwards until I get to 2.5 millimetres before top dead centre. At this point, the light should just go out. With cylinder one timed up, I then repeat the process for cylinders two, three, and four. With the timing complete, I can now use four ignition coils to connect up to the points to see if it sparks. I just rest the coils on the back of the engine for now. I'll make a bracket up later on, then I connect up with the four wires that go down to the contract breaker points, then there's a positive wire and a negative wire that go to the battery. I then remove the four spark plugs, connect them up to the spark plug caps, then kick the engine over and watch the sparks, and they were perfect, really big sparks. I was well pleased with that. With the ignition sorted, the next thing I'm going to be looking at is the four carburettors. These carburettors are getting on for 45 years old. I don't know what state they're going to be inside. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove the float bowls, take off the bottoms and have a look. Put all the aluminium bits in one tin and the brass bits in another tin for cleaning. The float bowl screws spin out freely, but the float bowls themselves are stuck hard and needed a fair bit of persuasion to come off. But this one is remarkably nice inside. I was really pleased with that. The second carburetor was a totally different story. I took off the float bowl and it was full of white powder and it really smelt horrible and it just fell out all over my hand. But actually underneath the white powder, it still looks salvageable, but we'll find out more when I take it completely apart. The third carburetor had like a coating of white deposits, but nowhere near as bad as the second carburetor. I think that one will clean up just perfect. And the last one was like brand new. I was totally shocked. It's like it had never been run. With the float poles removed, I can start stripping down the carburetors, first removing the main jet, then the floats. I decided to strip the cleanest carburetor first. It should just come apart easily with no problems. Even the fuel cutoff valve was mint. I think this carburetor would just work if I put it on the engine, but anyway, it's best to strip it down to clean it, just to make sure. The gasket's really hard and brittle, but I'll be making new ones. The tick over screw and pilot air screw then unscrew from the body, and the last thing I need to do is tap out the needle jet. With the first carburetor stripped, I then use my garage vacuum cleaner to suck up all that powdery mess. Don't ever be tempted to use the one out of the house, it'll make it proper smell. I decided to tackle the worst carburetor next. It was really badly seized up, so I put some penetrating oil on the pivot and managed to wiggle that free after a bit of persuasion. Then, very gently tap from each side with a little pin punch until the pin gradually starts to move. It's really important to be careful at this stage, otherwise you could snap off the aluminium posts. Well, that's the hardest bit done now, and I'm so relieved I got that pin out in one piece. So now we can continue with the strip. The floats themselves look in nice condition, and they'll clean up nicely. And the petrol cutoff valve was also quite corroded, but that would also clean up nicely. I think the white powder is a result of water getting into the carburetors and oxidising the surface of the aluminium, but the brass itself is in really nice condition and not damaged at all. Just as I thought I was home and dry, I went to remove the choke plunger, and it was jammed in solid. And these are really fragile and you can snap off the tangs if you try and twist them too much. So you put a bit of heat into the body with a blowtorch and I dripped in some penetrating oil until it soaked down the side and bubbled. Then with a bit more heat, I could see the oil soaking away down the side of the plunger and then it caught fire. But I simply put that on my finger. 
the plunger was still not budging. So I gave it a tap with a pin punch, a very gentle tap with a light hammer. And this sometimes breaks the, the actual bond of the corrosion. And it did, and it started to twist straight away. And I was able to pull it out with some pliers and it was in a real sorry state. But I think it had clean up. With all the carburetors stripped, I take them out into the garden to clean them up. I'll be using some special acids, so it's best to do it in an outside well ventilated area. I'm going to be cleaning up all the brass parts using a solution that clockmakers use to clean brass gears. It's like an acidic solution. You pour it into a container and then drop the parts in, leave it for about half an hour and they come up gleaming like brand new. Totally amazing. With the brass bits fizzing away nicely, I'm now going to clean the aluminium parts with alloy wheel cleaner. I carefully pour the alloy wheel cleaner into a bucket, then add all the aluminium parts until they're covered with a solution. They immediately start to fizz as the oxidation is removed from the surface by the acid. It's really nice working outside in the winter, even though the plants are looking a bit sad for themselves. After about five minutes, the fizzing stops, and that means they're done. So I remove them from the bucket and put them into a tray to rinse off with some water. Then I can tip the solution back into the container for use again in the future. The carburetors look absolutely amazing. They are like brand new. I am really pleased with that. So next thing I do is put them in my barbecue to dry them off. It's important to dry them off quickly so that the corrosion doesn't start to occur in the very small passages and drillings and the barbecue is just the perfect thing to do this. After about five minutes the aluminium parts are done, I come back through the house and there's no smell of cooking because Tracy's gone shopping for shoes and she'll be gone for hours. I then go back outside to get the brass bits. They've cleaned up amazing so I rinse them off with a hose and then put those in the barbecue to dry. They don't take very long. The clock cleaning solution really works well on the brass and they really do look like brand new. With all the parts cleaned and dry, I just need to check that the air feed to the emulsification tube is clear. It's a very small hole and I just check it with a jet pricker. Yep, yeah, that's okay. And I check all four carburetors just to make sure. I then use the airline to blow out the other drillings. When everything's clear, I can start assembly. And the first thing I put in is a needle jet, making sure the hole lines up with the rear of the carburetor. This just slides in nicely. As the needle jet slides down through the carburetor body, it has to line up with a little peg in the side. This holds it in the correct position. The brass washer and main jet can now be fitted. With the main jet tightened with a screwdriver, I pick up the pilot jet and just check that it's clear with my jet prickers. It's okay to do this if you're careful. Some say you shouldn't, but I've always done it. The pilot screw then screws straight into the carburetor body with a screwdriver and it's really important to make sure the screwdriver is the right size for the slot or you can sometimes damage them and you can't get them out. The next thing I fit is a petrol cutoff valve. This just screws into the carburetor body. I then fit the idle adjusting screw and the air screw, screwing it right in tight and then coming out one and a half turns. The fuel cutoff needle drops into the cutoff valve. This is in nice condition, didn't need any work. And now I can put in the pin and the float. And that pushes in just nicely. And it feels great. I then repeat the process with the other three carburetors, bringing them all up to the same stage. With the main assembly done, it's now time to set the float heights. And to do this, I use my Vernier caliper set to 25 millimeters. The float height measurement is taken from the gasket surface of the carburetor with the gasket removed to the bottom of the float, and it should measure 25 millimeters. If it's not, you just adjust a little tang until it does. That's better, that's 25 millimeters now. I now fit four new float bowl gaskets that I've made earlier and then the float bowls themselves and do up the four screws. I 
I can now start to assemble the top half of the carburetor. This is the throttle slides themselves and the needles. The needles are set to the third needle position and the retaining clip is put in with a spring and that goes back into the body and the cap can be screwed on. I'll be fitting cables later. A quick check with my thumb and the throttle snaps shut. That's really good. So now I can assemble the other three carburetors. When I was assembling the third carburetor, I suddenly realised I've only got one of these plates left and I'm going to need two. So I thought I can make a new one because they're really hard to find. So I got a bit of thin brass, cut out a circle with my tin snips roughly. Then I can put it between pressure pads on my lathe to turn the diameter. I take several cuts until it matches the diameter of the existing part using my micrometer. With the diameter matching perfectly, I can now mark it out and cut it out to shape. Making sure I leave extra material for the tang to be bent up. Well, that looks just perfect. Let's see if it fits into the slide. I then finish off by putting the slide into the carburetor body, dropping in the spring and screwing on the cap. With the four carburetors assembled, I put them onto the engine, one at a time. And they looked just amazing. I then fit the throttle cables and adjust the slides so they open together. With the throttle working nicely, the next thing I do is refit the coils and connect up all the wires, put the plug caps on, and then fill the carburetors up with a little bottle of petrol. I just want to check that the engine fires on four cylinders before I take it somewhere remote to test it properly and rev it up. So with the carburetors full, I connect up the battery and give it a kick. Well, that sounded really promising, so the next thing I'm going to do is connect up the four Delcovic header pipes. These header pipes are actually for a H2C, but they fit perfect on the S3 cylinders and look amazing. I fitted the header pipes so they poke out the side of the engine slightly, that way the engine will sit flat on the ground for the test start. My friend Henry's got a farm in the Cotswolds. He's in the middle of nowhere, just perfect for making some noise, so I load the engine to my pickup truck and drive over. Okay, this is it, troops. The well, moment we've been waiting you for, chokes, they up. Feel to those two wires that are being pulled up are chokes, and which um, when Josh is holding. When I tell you to. Right. Josh, <laughs> I tell you what, I need a week off. Did That's you know incredible. It? What do you reckon now? Really, really good. It's so smooth. No vibrations at all. <laughs> so it runs, it's just ready to go in the bike now, so that's the next thing to do. I can feel, right, the exhaust coming out. It hits me in the chest like a gunshot. Really? Yeah. I might put my earplugs in and run it once more. Oh, Lord, I haven't got any earplugs. Mm -hmm. You definitely need earplugs. I wasn't giving it proper rev because I'd have my earplugs out. Oh, no, no, you're not going to just leave me without any earplugs. Have you got any headphones? Borrow Josh's and he can put his fingers in his ears. OK? Yeah. <laughs>
is so peaceful in the Cotswolds, the sheep are grazing on the grass, and my Kawasaki engine is back in the back of my pickup truck, being really quiet on the drive home. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'm so pleased how the Kawasaki four-cylinder engine turned out, and I'm really looking forward to getting into a bike soon. Oh yeah, and if you're new to my channel, don't forget to check out my other videos for cool stuff to see.